He is one of the most influential game creators in the world. Will Wright's a major inspiration. And from the very beginning, he had a mission. He was always very curious, very inventive. He was into everything. But hardship would strike at an early age. My father died when I was nine, at which point we moved to Louisiana, where my mother grew up, and uh, was raised there. And his mother became his inspiration. She bought my first computer, and I don't think she understood what impact that was going to have on my life. I certainly didn't. He is a man who takes chances. Will is probably one of the most creative, intelligent people in the industry. He never goes by the formula, never follows the crowd. Who refuses to take no for an answer. They just didn't want to publish it, so it kind of sat on the shelf. And they're like, no, no one's going to buy this. This game's not going to be very popular. He had his own doubts. I didn't really think it would be that popular. I was thinking it might appeal to some strategy game people, maybe some architects. But never let go of a dream. It is now well, officially the biggest selling PC game of all time. It is a phenomenon of incredible proportions. This is the story of Will Wright, the man behind The Sims. It's a license to print money. That's what it is. In the spring of 2002, Sims creator Will Wright received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the International Game Developers Association. And his biggest fan has been beside him every step of the way. There's one other person, a very special person I want to thank tonight. Um, without her, I certainly would not be here, and that's my mother. Let's go back to the beginning and find out how it all began. He was out into a Montessori school when he was three years old. And the teachers there made it quite clear, or right from the start, that he was very bright. And the one thing that I could do is feed him information. Well, I lived in Georgia for 10 years. Um, my father died when I was nine, at which point we moved to Louisiana, where my mother grew up. I was kind of an odd kid growing up, if you can imagine. Um, he was always very curious, very inventive. He was into everything. I would jump around from subject to subject and just get totally obsessed with it. It's been all my time just, you know, obsessing and studying, you know, one thing after another. As he got a little older, he got into building robots and things like that. Never a dull moment. Oh, she was always very supportive. She was the most wonderful mother I could imagine having because, you know, she would kind of let me pursue my interests and she would encourage it and just kind of, um, you know, if she could help, she would. But generally, you know, she was just kind of, what in the world is he doing now? You know, type of thing. A simple gift would change everything forever. She bought my first computer for me as a Christmas present, and I don't think she understood, you know, what an impact that was gonna have on my life. I certainly didn't. In the late 1970s, Wright packs up his computer and heads for Louisiana Tech to study computer programming. But the bayou would soon be bye-bye. I left there and went to uh, New York, and lived in New York for about a year. Went to the New School for Social Research. It's near NYU. It's a, kind of a liberal arts college. Yet the anxious mind has no plans of settling down. He was just so into various things that I didn't understand. So I studied things like, you know, mechanical engineering, architecture, aviation, got a pilot's license. That's about the time that the personal computer was just coming out. I was in college and I bought an Apple II uh, to connect to my robots. At this point, my robots are getting fairly elaborate. These big things running around, making holes in the walls. And that's kind of when I fell into software. But he falls out of love with being a student. After five years of study, Wright leaves without a sheepskin. How will his biggest fan feel? I was afraid he wouldn't be able to make a living. Will's desire for more leads him out west and into the arms of someone special. Well, I'd actually met my wife in Louisiana who was living in California, and that was the real reason I moved to California originally. But at the same time, I was getting into computers, and that also was kind of like, you know, the center of the universe for the computer industry. Wright quickly finds work designing computer programs, but can't seem to keep his feet on the ground when it comes to video games. The very first games I was buying were like the very first flight simulator program from Bruce Artwick, you know, which is all wireframe graphics. You actually had to write your own assembly language patch to make the thing work. So, you know, very low tech, but still at the time, it was this little, self-contained world in a box that I could go explore and it had its own little rules of physics that you could program. And so, you know, to me that was just immensely attractive. That attraction changes his destiny. When I decided, you know, I'm gonna try and make a commercial game. And at that point there had actually been a lot of people with, you know, four-year head start on me on the Apple. They were producing some really spectacular things. 
and I decided that probably my best chance would be to buy one of the newer computers that was just coming out and learn that as fast as I could. Will is probably one of the most creative and intelligent people in the industry. He never goes by the formula, never follows the crowd. I mean, he's always off on his own. The Commodore 64 was coming out right around that time, and I bought one of those, one of the very first units, and just dedicated myself to absorbing the machine, learning every little thing about it. And so my first game was actually based upon that machine, and it was based upon some of the unique uh, technical features within the Commodore that the Apple II couldn't do. And well, moms will be moms. I thought he should go get a job. I really didn't approve of that because I, I, I didn't understand the whole field. But when there's a will, there's a way. I had something fairly playable within about, oh, well, maybe five, six months. And I was living in California then, and so I, you know, looked around and found that, you know, a lot of the game publishers were right around me in that area, and I knew that. So I drove to, like, three of them and showed them this game that I was working on. I actually went to Electronic Arts, Creative Software, and Broderbund. And he gets his first bite when Broderbund snaps up the rights to his very first game. Well, in right on Bungley Bay, basically, you were flying over these islands in this helicopter and bombing these factories, and there was this whole production thing going on, and this underlying simulation of this economy that you were trying to disrupt with your bombing. To create this game, one of the things I had to do is I had to make a, uh, a little kind of tool program to scroll around and, and draw the islands. I would draw the coastlines and the roads and the little buildings. Toward the end of the project, I was actually having more fun building these islands and designing them than I was bombing them in the real game. Although sales in the U.S. are disappointing. It didn't sell very well in the U.S. because piracy was very big in those days. Raid on Bungling Bay becomes one of the first U.S. titles to be exported to Japan. In Japan, it was one of the first games released on the first Nintendo system. And in Japan, it sold almost a million units. I had a lot of royalties coming in from Bungling Bay. So I was living off of that comfortably. It actually took about a year off when my daughter was born, just to kind of, you know, spend raising her. He is also nurturing something else. After destroying targets, he sets his hopes on another type of game. After I finished that game, I kind of kept playing with the editor and thinking, you know, well, you know, it'd be even cooler if I could somehow make these little islands come to life. And so that's when I started researching, you know, like traffic simulations, land use, urban growth. I think because he's well-read and he thinks about a lot of things and he plans a lot of things in the design phase, it takes more time about his concept of game and experiments with programming things. And Will Wright plants a seed for a simulation game that will add a new dimension to video games and change his life forever. By the late 1980s, Will Wright has already created the successful video game Raid on Bongling Bay and is hard at work on his second title for Broderbund. It's an unusual type of game that blurs the line between virtual and reality. And all of a sudden, I had this little guinea pig of a city that I could kind of experiment and poke and prod. Wright continues working on the game for the Commodore 64. At some point, you know, I realized that I had kind of gone, you know, past the point of no return. I was putting so much effort into this thing that, you know, wow, you know, this could be a product, you know, somehow. Wright envisions a game in which the players create the world in which the characters live. That's the entire game. What an original concept. Unfortunately, those at Broderbund weren't feeling it. I have the highest respect for the Carlson brothers that started Broderbund, and just great guys. And so, I, you know, I don't attribute any of it to any lack of insight on their part, because it, that happens to everybody. It's happened to me so many times. But Broderbund yearns for something a little more traditional. They didn't quite evolve in the direction they were expecting it. They kept expecting there to be something where there was a win-lose at the end. They just didn't want to publish it, so it kind of sat on the shelf. One of the most successful franchises in game history almost dies then and there, but a fateful meeting leads to some divine intervention. I met Jeff Braun um, at some computer thing, and uh, I showed him the game, and he was just, you know, astounded by it. He said, oh, this is great. Oh, man, you know, we should sell this. And he eventually convinced me uh, to help him start a games company, and that's when we started Maxis. And around that time, the new computers were coming out, the new uh, Macintosh and the Amiga. And so we hired a few programmers, and I redesigned the game for those computers. You know, and if you told a programmer, this is what I want to do, and I want this to happen, they're going to say, okay, you know, give me $100 million in 100 years, and I can make that happen, because it's just so unreasonable. But the way he looks at these things, he goes, no, that's not that unreasonable at all. We started our company, Maxis, and we programmed SimCity on the new computers. SimCity is ready for present and you won't believe where the brand new company takes the brand new game. When we finished this in 1989 or so, we actually went back to Broderbond and showed it to them. And they said, wow, that's cool. Yes, you know, we want to publish that. And so in some sense, it's really nice that they had kind of rejected it because Maxis would have never happened, I think, otherwise. SimCity is ready for its 1989 debut. 
but is the world ready for such an unusual game? With no ending? The Sim games really are the model of some chunk of reality that you're familiar with, and then allowing you to sit there and interact with it, play with it. Players of SimCity are actually city planners and have unlimited power over every aspect of a real city, including natural disasters and attacks by creatures. The ideas he brings to the game, the different fields he studies, you'll see him in an interview or if you talk to him, you'll, you'll just be amazed about sort of the breadth of knowledge and understanding of machines, how people relate to machines, how people relate to programs. He puts that all together and creates these really amazing revolutionary games. But is this game a bit too revolutionary? When I designed SimCity, I didn't really think it would be that popular. I was thinking it might appeal to some strategy game people, um, maybe some architects. But right is wrong. SimCity is released in 1989. The game Nobody Can Win is a hit with critics and game fans. It was so easy to use and also was in real time. Most games previous to then had been more turn-based and had sort of an ugly sort of top-down perspective and he brought an isometric look to the game. The game is a major success with the ladies, who make up 35% of the loyal players. I was really amazed at the broad appeal it had, because again, you know, to me it felt like this kind of techy, strategic thing. But I think something about the fact that we took a strategy game and we based around something that everybody knew about, like traffic, buildings coming up and land values changing. The game embraces many of the founding partners' beliefs. Its messages promote protection of the environment, and the game is pro-mass transit. You think that uh, building more roads will solve traffic, but in reality, building more roads tends to breed traffic. And you have to kind of play a dynamic simulation to understand you know, the, the wares and why fors of why that happens. So I'd kind of say that's the essence of what the sim games are to me. The game becomes the godfather to a brand new category. I think the first time I heard about the term god games was we came out with SimCity, and right around the same time, Peter Molyneux came out with Populous. When people saw that both of these games, you know, kind of had this overarching control of these little societies, there's obviously some commonality between these two things. Let's call it God Games. Over the next few years, various Sims titles follow the original game. Although the disappointing sales of Sim Earth, released in 1990, are attributed to its 220 page manual, other updates are more successful. Still, fans remain loyal to the original release that goes on to sell millions of units. But for the creator of this virtual world, there are some very real things in the game that truly hit home. Well, actually, uh, we lost our home in the Oakland Hills fire um, in 91. Not too long after that, actually, I started working on SimCity 2000. And so one of the scenarios I designed for SimCity 2000 was the Oakland Hills scenario. And in fact, you know, there's a little map showing where my house is on the map. And I could replay the scenario and put the whole Oakland fire department around my house. And you know, the rest of Oakland would burn down, but my house would be saved. <laughs> It's almost kind of a catharsis, being able to replay this aspect of my life in the game. SimCity 2000 is released in late 1993 and has an abundance of new structures. SimCity players can move their cities into the new game for enhancement. It's a hit. The game with no winner consistently ends up a winner. And so the sim games, I think, are much more over here on the hobby arena. I think hobbies are something that a lot of people spend a lot of time and effort on, but they don't have closure. They're more about skill. They're more about creativity. In the spring of 1996, the sim franchise sells its three millionth game. More than 50 websites run by fans of the game are running worldwide. And it's just like a real community. You go outside, and there's huge diversity of both you know, form and theme and function. In July 1997, game giant Electronic Arts announces the purchase of Will Wright's company, Maxis, for a reported $125 million. EA persuades Wright to stay on board by promising that he'll get to develop a pet project, a game that will simulate the behavior of a human family. That was a little side project he had been working on for several years, and after he had sold Maxis to Electronic Arts, and well, nobody at EA, like the corporate higher-ups, weren't too keen on the game. So Wright continues the sim magic and the money train for new boss EA with SimCopter in 1998. SimCity 3000 ships more than 1 million copies in just 10 months after its 1999 release. Wright uses his clout to push for the release of his pet project. Now he stuck with it and because he was Will Wright, he had had his success with SimCity. He was able to, look, I really believe in this game. I want to do this game. Let's publish this game, see what happens. But not even Will Wright is prepared for what will happen next.
by January 2000, 40-year-old Will Wright's Sim franchise has sold more than 8 million games worldwide. For five years, he has quietly been at work on a pet project, a simulation game that will bring the game characters in SimCity alive. It's one of those games that's really difficult to identify, to just say, you know, it fits this genre or this genre. It really doesn't. It's, it's a game all its own. There are rumors that EA, owner of rights company Maxis, is skeptical of the chances for the game's success. They saw the design specs, they saw the write-ups, and they're like, No one's going to buy this. This game's not going to be very popular. But The Sims, released in February 2000, brings new life to The Sims world. So he's going, I want to design a world in which the game player can have the little people that they're nurturing, but I want them to have a jillion choices that are going to change who they become and how people relate to them. Little people in your computer, that's what they are. Little interactive people, you can shape their lives, mold them, help them along. Let them date. <laughs> Let them build relationships. Have kids. Go scale the career ladder. Do whatever they want. <laughs> Players can give their Sims a unique appearance or personality, even model characters after family or friends. Sims communicate in gibberish. You don't actually hear the words of their conversation. The sound effects, though, convey emotion. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a blah, blah, blah. And they could be excited. <laughs>most importantly, players can drop down to street level and walk among their creations. When you've got a sandbox like The Sims is to play around with, you'll play around in all kinds of ways. Although they are a bit self-directed, the real fun is in the directing of their little lives. These tiny critters even exhibit human traits, like love and jealousy. <laughs> their sickness and even death. EA's fears about failure are quickly quelled. Just one day after the game is launched, websites are already praising the new game's merits. By June, it is the top-selling PC game of the year and sells nearly 2 million copies. Fans are addicted. Some spend up to 30 hours a week playing the game. I don't find them to be any different than those people who are addicted to EverQuest or addicted to Quake or Unreal Tournament. They have The Sims, and, and that's perfectly fine and acceptable. It's a, it's a great game. The Sims is the top grossing computer game of 2000, selling more than 3.3 million copies. Yet something more real moves right. Now the game is becoming kind of almost a tool for autobiographies where people are kind of chronicling things that happened to them, abusive relationships or deaths in the family. Somebody did one about 9-11, you know, kind of explaining what they were doing that day and how it played out. And so it's actually kind of interesting that the game can become uh, a tool of expression like this. When I started The Sims, I mean, the very first thing I wanted, you know, from step one was to make the game very expandable. Expansion packs arrive in a quick succession. It's a license to print money. That's what it is. EA should be so happy with him because each and every one comes out and just sells a million of them. The expansion pack is just a real sort of good example of how ongoing the popularity of The Sims is. There is Sims Vacation, which you can take your Sims on vacation. You can actually go out on a date, go to a restaurant, go to a club afterwards, and it's all about coming to that moment where all of a sudden the crowd separates and it's just the two of you, you share a romantic kiss. Sim Golf was a, a project that kind of started as a game about designing a golf course and grew and grew into a game about people and the way they interact and the comedy of what happens on a golf course. Oh. It's more than a game about golf, it's almost a game about life.
And for the game about life, well, that franchise has sold more than 20 million units worldwide. And Will Wright seems to have created a game that may never end. I'm not sure that there is anybody that hasn't heard or played The Sims right now. It is now well, officially the biggest selling PC game of all time. It is a phenomenon of incredible proportions. How will Will keep the success coming? We're all looking forward to the PS2 version and the much anticipated online version. Sims Online, we'll have to see. It is kind of staggering to think that if you give all these people that are interested in The Sims the tools to go create their own online world, who knows what's going to happen. It could be incredibly successful or it could fall flat. Ow! It is going to be a real experiment, but The Sims phenomenon has legs. His major contribution would be that he is helping to broaden the industry, apart from its more narrow appeal and the more narrow demographic. Although he has inspired those in the gaming industry. Will Wright's a, a major inspiration. He really blazed a trail with SimCity. And has fans around the globe. There is nobody on the planet that is more proud than his very home. own mother. He doesn't brag about anything. I have to twist people's arms to, to find out about the different awards he's won. She didn't really care what I did as long as I enjoyed life. And, you know, that was probably the best lesson that she ever taught me. I think that, you know, just the fact that I'm happy, you know, is her probably biggest reward. Oh, I'm so proud.